Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the fantastic Jessalyn Gilsig, currently starring in the Disney Plus series Big Shot. And the first thing that I was really interested in is finding the voice of a show, because anytime that you're working on a new television show, it's the creative team, it's the cast, all trying to figure out what the voice of the show is going to be. And so with Big Shot, I was really interested in what that looked like for you all and the types of conversations that you were having and trying to find that. That is such a great question and, and an excellent point because I think tone is something that as an actor, you're trying to pick up very quickly. Like, what am I bringing? What's my contribution? What's the rhythm of the show? What are they looking for? We had a little bit of an indicator because it was David Kelly. And uh, we know that David Kelly, uh, he, he's just the master at a lot of comedy, very, very clearly drawn characters, but it always has to be grounded. It always has to be based in something that's real and true and the stakes have to be significant. They're not, um, you know, they're not just a, an afterthought. And then I think the next dimension for me was John because John Stamos is a very specific kind of actor. He's one of the best kind of actors to work with, which is that he's, he's live. Nothing about him is by rote. Nothing about him is rehearsed. Everything is, you know, he comes from sitcoms. So it's like working with somebody on stage. He's just completely uh, driven by the moment and what we're feeling. And if it isn't based in reality, if it isn't honest, then we have work to do and then we'll rework the scene or we'll rework the blocking. But we, nothing was ever just good enough. Everything was set at a very high standard. And uh, so you kind of get all that signaling and then you try to kind of slip your way in and, and hope that you can kind of stay pace with everybody else. And within that point about working with John and things feeling very alive, was there less rehearsal and figuring out scenes before you went into filming them because of the way that he works and the way that stylistically you were coming together? Well, in TV, you do a surprise, very little rehearsal. It's kind of amazing. Uh, you, you almost as an actor kind of have to elbow your way to get some space for rehearsal. It's actually the opposite with John, which is we did rehearse a lot because once you've rehearsed, the cameras are locked in and then it's really hard to make changes after that point. So really with John, he always wants to make sure that the physicality, you know, the, the show has a lot of motion. It's a sports show. And so we really resisted, you know, there's it's very rare that we stand still, that we sit still. And so we actually rehearse things quite a bit. I guess with John, what's unique is then when you go to perform it, I mean, that guy never gives the same line reading twice. Everything is so uh, act and react. And so it's very present and it's very live. And with your character development process, was there a research element to this character or did you find that you were really understanding her and breaking her down based on the scripts and the details that they were giving you more? I'm a sports fan and I'm actually a really big fan of girls participating in sports. I was very involved in sports as a kid. You know, I always maintain I'm not a great athlete. Nobody ever scouted me and said, oh, wow, you should play division one basketball or you should be a long distance runner. That wasn't the point. But the point was that I always participated. And I it's not just that you have this sense of fun and the sense of play, but it's being a part of a team. It's it's it, it's a natural built in sort of social dynamic. So you don't have to so you're not just left to your own devices in the schoolyard. So in a way I felt uh, kind of ready for this because I, I think it's a really important topic and it's one that I really care about. I also love basketball. And so, uh, and I'm also a soccer mom and I'm uh, a um, unofficial coach, which is to say that I have a lot of ideas, but really nobody wants to hear them. So th those kinds of things all together, I think was sort of life experience that made me feel like I, I was qualified to be an assistant coach at a high school. Maybe if I was playing John's part and I was an NCAA coach, it would have required a little bit more uh, immersive research. Within that space of her being an assistant coach to this team as well, how did you map out what type of coach you wanted her to be? You know, how is it that she's going to support them when they're doing well? How is she going to approach things when they're not winning and they're not doing their best to encourage them to play better, play smarter? And so how did you really determine what those characteristics of her would be? 
Yeah, my approach to Holly was really uh, through that of being uh, more of a teacher in the sense that I think that she sees her role as helping the girls develop as people, as individuals, helping them overcome obstacles, helping them uh, sort of access their goals and that kind of thing. So I think my approach, as much as I think Holly is invested in winning because I think she's a competitive person, I think my, my kind of into the show was to actually really individualize each girl and try to really sort of um, be a mentor and be a guide for them. Uh, because I don't think she's, I think that the, the sport is a device to help with their development as opposed to the other way around. And within that idea of individualizing each of the relationships and dynamics that she has with each of the girls on the team, what are some of the, the choices that you made about different ways that she might have relationships and rapports with them because of that? Yeah, it was really interesting because the, the, the players on the team, you know, we sort of have like the main five that we, that we work with and they're really very individual. So for example, Nell's character, Louise, she's a, a girl who has a lot of family pressure and she is gunning for division one basketball. So I have some really great instances with her where I'm really pushing her, where I feel like she's backing off of her goals and I'm really driving her. But then cricket, for example, who plays Samantha, she's not a great player, but she, and she doesn't have a lot of confidence. So it was more a question of uh, being there for her and helping, helping build up her confidence and not so much intimidating her, but reassuring her. And what was really fun about the show is that a lot of it, you know, when we're doing the practices on screen or we're doing the games on screen, a lot of it is improvised. So you can still use that sort of those individual uh, focuses about each character. You can incorporate them into your improv. And then jumping back to working with David Kelly, you know, he's he's a prior collaborator of yours. And so within coming into a show with someone who already knows what your strengths are as an actor, are there aspects of Holly that you feel that he really put in place knowing what you would be able to bring and, and the dimension that you would be able to add to her? You know, it's always a mystery when you get a job a little bit because, yeah, certainly in this instance, because I had a history with David Kelly and I had a, a history with Bill D'Elia, who's also one of our producers, I, I, you think, okay, well, they know what they're getting. But I'll tell you a funny story. When I was on Glee, that was a job that I also got as a result of having worked with Ryan Murphy on Nip Tuck. And I remember when he offered me Terry Schuster, I remember on the first day, I hadn't really talked to him much. And so on the first day I got to set of Glee and I thought, well, I'll just do what I did on Nip Tuck because he seemed to like that. And he walked by my trailer and he very casually said, listen, I don't know who Terry is, but I know she's nothing like your character on Glee. And I thought, oh, well, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do now. So in a way, I, I, what I've come to learn is they're really just hiring the actor and then they're trusting that you can transform into finding the character, but they're not necessarily saying, hey, you do this, can you do that again? Uh, so I, ma I made a point of not doing that, <laughs> but that was a really scary day. <laughs> And speaking of working with Ryan on Nip Tuck, you know, I love the way that you've described how playing that character really forced you to make much bolder choices in characters that you've played subsequently. Um, mm -hmm. And so when you look at characters that you've played since that, and, you know, even up to this show, what are some of the things that you feel like you've really found in yourself as a performer and an actor that maybe you wouldn't have discovered had you not played that role? Yeah, I think Nip Tuck was probably the most, I mean, the, there are earlier roles that were great sort of to get my feet wet, but in a way that was the most formative to realizing, I think what I learned on Nip Tuck was to advocate for my character through my performance. I think on the page, maybe she was just, you know, another one of Christian's conquests, but for some reason, I had some kind of drive in me to not let this woman be minimized. And it worked. It really got a response. I think that I wasn't looking for a response. I just didn't want her to be reduced. And so once I saw that that was effective and that that kind of allowed the character sort of to stay in the scene. And as I say, kind of to advocate, you know, to say, hey, don't write this person off. Don't just assume that they're one thing, that they're a trope or something like that. That's kind of how I've approached my work ever since. And I always try to give my characters a secret, you know, a, a private plan that that they just have within themselves, like we all do. And uh, it's funny, I was working on Vikings. And when I when I first started on that show, I didn't have a lot of lines. 
And I remember thinking, well, okay, I'm going to work on my listening. That's going to be my kind of task that I set for myself. And we shot multiple cameras. So it was kind of fun because even if you weren't speaking, you knew there was a possibility that you were on camera. So I was filming and I, and I had these kind of, I started building this sort of internal life for my character that she was sort of attracted to this one and that she was thinking that that one wasn't to be trusted. And I was just sort of playing these things in my head. And I get a call one day from the editor of the show. And she says, what are you thinking in this scene? And I said, oh, I was thinking this and I was thinking that. And she said, okay, I'm going to edit to that. And you realize, you know, as an actor, your role is to just give options. You know, you're really communicating with the editor. That's really what you're doing. You're giving the editor enough options so that they have places to go if they want to cut away from whoever is the actual focus of the scene. And so that's, I think, a, a kind of a approach that started on Nip Talk and has evolved over time. And, and I will say it also just makes your job a lot easier. You know, you can never look at a role again and say, oh, I don't have a lot of lines, so I don't have a lot to do. It's just not true. Active listening is as important as any other part of acting. And further to that point about how you're giving the editor options through your performance, when you first produced a feature film, you know, that was a huge learning experience in seeing so many of the aspects behind the camera and you were incredibly hands-on in every single step of making mm -hmm. that film. And so what are the things even beyond what you were just saying about editing that you really learned that have influenced your work now in front of the camera? I think every actor should have to work in a different department to truly appreciate what is involved in every department. And what one of the most valuable things that I got from producing Somewhere Slow was that as an actor, your role is your department and you need to care for and kind of sustain your department until somebody comes in and asks you to make an adjustment. But it's also your job to have an awareness and a consciousness that other people are running their departments. and not to be a disruptor in that space to to be aware that you're that this is that you're trying to be cohesive i think all the other departments know that and sometimes actors are sort of assumed to be well let's just kind of get around them but i think as an actor once you start to understand oh wait a minute if i shift my body just this way then that camera can catch me and then we won't have to do another setup later those are the kinds of things that you can be helpful to the, to the progression of the project. And I never would have learned all those things if I hadn't actually put myself in somebody else's shoes. And also even off the back of that story about creating an inner dialogue that then became part of the plot, part of your job as an actor, particularly in television, is to create a character and to make very specific choices, but to make adjustable choices because you mm. never know what it's going to go. It might be like, oh, she was a professional ballerina when she was 18 and you didn't <laughs> yeah. know. Oh, her parents are actually Russian. Surprise. You know, she's in love so with this true. guy. It's been five years. Yep. And so within He's her that, brother. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> within that on Big Shot, what are some of the ways in which you really approached Holly with that fortitude of making really decisive choices about who she was going to be, but knowing that every choice had to be adjustable potentially. That's very insightful that, that you would know that because I think one of the things I've learned, uh, especially with working, John is a very good example of this. Gabriel Byrne was another really good example of this. When you work with people who are really at the top of their game, that's exactly what they do. They come in with very specific ideas. They never come in and say, I don't know what to do here. You tell me what to do. They come in and they give an option. And if the response to that option is that doesn't work for us, they immediately, you immediately have to pivot. Now, it doesn't mean you make a choice that you can't support within yourself. You still have to find a way to, to, uh, to participate in the choice so that you feel that it can be justified. But the most difficult actors to work with are the rigid ones who really think, well, there's only one way to do this. You know, filmmaking is problem solving. That's all it is. From morning to night, it's trying to figure out how are we going to pull this off? And I think as an actor, you have to realize that no should never be in your vocabulary. It can be, hey, what about this? Or here's another idea, or I could we come to some kind of a compromise? But you, the, the, it's so true. You have to come in with very specific ideas and you have to come in being willing to be flexible. 
And to your point earlier about advocating for a lot of your characters, you know, one of the things that I think you do so well with all of the characters that you build out is you create this real inner fortitude and strength within them in very different ways. And even when you look at Holly, she doesn't need to be the first person to say something out loud. You know, there's mm -hmm. that scene where a bunch of the teachers are in the middle of teacher politics within the school and she doesn't say anything for half the time but then when she feels like she does need to say something she's completely ready and has a really valid point and chooses her words very carefully so in building her out how did you think about that quiet inner strength and fortitude that yeah. you wanted her to have well thank you for that I appreciate it I think I think that it really comes from exactly what you're describing is a kind of stillness and just to always be listening and to always be thinking, okay, where did I come from? Where am I going? What do I want? How much do I care? Who is that person to me? Who is that person to me? And if you come into a scene with all those questions and all of that curiosity, you'll never be bored. I mean, you really won't, you know? I mean, that's the weird thing about my job is when people come to see it, they say, oh my gosh, you did it a thousand times. And I think, yeah, but it was interesting every single time <laughs> to me, I found it interesting. So I don't, I'm not a line counter ever. I always think, well, if I'm on the call sheet, then it's an opportunity for me to make a contribution and I'll find a way to do it, whether I'm talking or not. I also really love the moment where her way of encouraging the students to take things into their own hands when they've been restricted on how many practice practices they can do isn't to tell them exactly what to do. It's to kind of just casually drop just enough information for them to start and piece it together. Um, yeah. And so once you realize that that's her tactic a lot of the time, you know, how did that then infiltrate the way that you thought about her coaching them in general throughout the series? I think, gosh, you have such interesting, uh, you know, readings of the show. I love it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think Holly's an intuitive person. I think she's a natural educator. You know, I think uh, Coach Corn, John's character, is is an incredible coach, and he's uh, a competitive guy, and he knows how to get the win. But I think what's special about Holly, and that there are a lot of people in the world who do this, is that they're that they're intuitive and they're and they're deep deep listeners and like you say they don't always have to be the loudest voice in the room it was interesting playing his assistant because i did spend a lot of time kind of following john stamus around with a clipboard and i remember thinking kind of like what we were saying earlier about being advocate for your character i thought well i can't let her be reduced to this so this unto itself has to be important she has to believe that this is making a meaningful contribution because I didn't want her just to be this woman who just like chased this guy around. I wanted her to feel that she was an, an integral part and an important part, even her, in her silence and in, and in her quietness. And given that she's been teaching at the school for several years and already has this relationship with the students that she's coaching and he's coming into a newly filled position right above her, did you think of her as someone who wanted that job that maybe would have asked for that promotion and is a little bit resentful underneath it all? Or do you think that, you know, she sees the impact that she's able to have with her position as it is? Well, that's a really interesting question. I actually think it's the latter first, which is that I don't think she ever really thought to put herself forward. And then I think as the show evolves and she realizes like we all kind of do. And I think that people talk about women being this way that we sometimes they say that women, uh, men will men will take a job and then figure out how to do it. And women won't take a job until they figured out how to do it. And at that point, the opportunity has passed. And I think Holly might be a victim of that. You know, he's actually no better equipped to coach a high school basketball team than she is. He may be better equipped to coach an NCAA team. And I think as the show evolves, she starts to see that, but he sees it as well. He sees her value and he, uh, in some ways, by encouraging her, it actually puts them into conflict, which is going to be really interesting as the season develops. And the way that they both present themselves to the world alongside each other is kind of an interesting dynamic to look at on screen as well in terms of the visuals, because, you know, he's coaching a high school girls basketball team, and yet he's always wearing suit pants, a button up shirt, uh -huh. a tie and carrying his blazer as if he was still in the pros. And then yeah. your character is more about function over presentation um, mm -hmm. and really just kind of like they're wearing the sweatpants, ready to move, ready to do whatever she needs to. And so you how did come you and be a writer on our show? I, I just think you need. <laughs> To come and be on the show. Done. <laughs> <laughs> but how did how did a detail like that give you another layer and another aspect of her once you learned that? 
That was huge because John's wardrobe is so fire. You know, I mean, it's money, it's gorgeous. It looks like, like you say, it looks like he's got somewhere else to be. And Holly is in this track suit where if she went out into the world, it would be, everybody would say, oh, are you a coach? You look like a coach. One of the things that I liked about wearing the tracksuit all the time, as you say, is I think it, there was a practical aspect to it, which is that she's ready to jump in there. She's ready to, to, to do drills with the girls. The other thing that I really liked about it was it helped me access that Holly is an athlete and her relationship to her body is that she sees herself not as a woman in that traditional sense of like what, what impression men am I making, but actually this body is a tool for this sport and she wants to communicate that to the girls as well. So she kind of brings herself to their level and says, yeah, we're just, we're not here for show. We're here to perform in this sport using our bodies as a tool. And for me as a woman, it's one of the reasons that I think it's so important that girls be encouraged to try sports and to participate because we get so much messaging for girls that's, you know, your body is some kind of you know, thing to be objectified and how is it and how does it measure up? And actually when you participate in sports and you move, your body becomes a tool and you really are accessing your power. And it's just a very different way to relate to yourself. It also says so much about her as a character and the fact that that very first episode, his first day, the first thing that she ever does is say, let's go get a drink, let's hang out. And he immediately assumes that it's some sort of nefarious way to undermine him. But it's yeah. not. It's really just how are you doing? How is how is your first day? How can I help you? What information can I give you about the girls? Um, and so when you looked at the script and you looked at a detail like that, how did something like that then inform all the other interactions that you had? Because you then know that she's someone who makes space for every single person around her and immediately creates an open environment. Yeah, that scene was, uh, the, the scenes where we go to the bar are some of my favorite scenes and we have similar scenes as the series goes on. And I think exactly, I think it shows you that, first of all, Holly doesn't have much else going on in her life. You know, she clearly she was free. And that really, you know, these girls being a teacher, being a, a their coach is a calling. And I think as much as she's, trying to check in on him. She's also trying to check, are these girls safe? And is this guy really somebody that we can let around these girls? Cause he can't do damage. This is such a fragile time in their lives. It's such a fragile moment. So if he's not going to bring value, then that's going to be of concern to Holly. Yeah. And then there's also the added aspect that all of this is taking place within a private school. And so it's not just about everything that's happening on the court. There's a lot of politics within the faculty that we were mentioning earlier. Yeah. There's also a lot of parental politics, like, you know, the fact that one of the main stars on the team, her dad has the entire basketball court named yeah. after his family, yeah. you know, and the fact that that makes her feel like she can't tell her anything that she can't do because of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so how did you want to play that aspect and that side of it into her? That was really interesting because, uh, you know, as a parent now, I can see, you know, I, I've heard from teachers that the most difficult part of teaching is the parents, that their involvement and their insistence on advocating for their children above all other children is, uh, is their biggest frustration. And so I liked Holly because I don't think Holly really, I mean, there is a scene when, when Grzynski comes in and he blows her off and she's just as happy to blow him off. I don't think she really, that's not, she doesn't feel like she's working for the parents. That's not her primary goal. I think that Yvette Nicole Brown's character, Sherilyn, I think she's the one who has to appease the parents, but Holly's not going to play that game. She's there for the girls. She's advocating for the girls and she's going to protect them at all costs. And then jumping back a little bit to that dynamic with John Stamos's character, even just in the first few episodes, there's already such an evolution in the dynamic that the two of you have built together. And in particular, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's episode three where his father's passed away and then he comes back and all the girls rally around him. And there's that really beautiful exchange between the two of you where you just look at each other across the court yeah. and it feels like that's a really pivotal moment in their yeah. relationship. And so when you have a scene like that, where it's all about that nonverbal communication, but you know that that's a tipping point to their dynamic, how, how do you kind of go into a scene like that with him? Well, 
there are some things about acting that are really difficult when you have to really generate something and you have to imagine that you're somewhere, you have to draw, pull, pull up emotion or create, try to create a substitution. And then sometimes you do something and everybody brings their, brings their a game and the moment occurs. It just happens. And honestly, with John's approach to that episode, which he did such a beautiful job and then the girls and the, and the sort of sincerity. And I think, you know, we were at that moment coming together as a team, you know, just even uh, on and off the set. And so really what's so nice about acting is if you create a really safe environment, then when your eyes meet in that moment, the emotion is already there. You know, it's all born out of the space and out of the moment. Well, I'm my I'm so intrigued to see where this relationship and this dynamic goes amongst all of the characters the rest of the season. And thank you so much for sharing all of this with us, Jessalyn. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Your questions were phenomenal. I really appreciate it. Thank you.